Good morning again. Uh, if you have a Bible, please turn to it uh, in 1 Corinthians 4. I forgot to put the page number in, so if you're looking in the Pew Bible, it's right there in the Bible somewhere. It's uh, after Romans, Corinthians, after Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Then you come to the five T's of, of Paul's letters, and 1 Thessalonians is, bef- is the first of them. So uh, take some time to, to find that out. A couple just announcements if you got here late. First of all, the women's kickoff event is still today at 3 o'clock, but it's in the fellowship hall um, here at church. It's at 3 o'clock. And then also right after the service, we're going to try to do a group photo with taken by a drone outside, assuming it's not raining, and I want everyone to come to that. It's not just for church members. It's to reflect the worshiping community here, Uh, and so please come. If you know me, you know that I very, very rarely put pressure on people to do a church activity, but I'd kind of hate if we took all this time and effort to take a group photo, and there's like seven of us there, so I would love if you would, we'll try to end a bit early, if you would just take the extra time, and I'll give instructions as we come to it. Um, and if you have to leave, you have to leave, but I would really love for everyone to just stay for that. It should not take long at all, and it should be fun, so uh, that's right after the service. But now we're in 1 Thessalonians. I've taken about four months off of this, so we're getting back to there, and as I have mentioned, we head now into the subject of Christian behavior, and particularly this morning, sexual morality. So if you are visiting or new with us, Please understand that we don't talk about this often. We are not obsessed with it. Uh, However, we are committed to preaching whatever text is before us, and here is where we are. It would be cowardly to skip it and not helpful to you. Uh, And then also realize, if you're just joining with us new this semester, that it's taken Paul four chapters to get here. He has spent the first three chapters giving thanks for these brothers and sisters in Thessalonica, Uh, And he has reminded them of the gospel of God's love for them in Jesus Christ, that they are already accepted by what God has already done for them. So living sexually pure lives does not get them into heaven. They are forgiven. But they are not just saved from something. They are saved to something, and this is part of what we are saved to. Now, parents, fair warning, as I tried to send an email I will use chaste language. I'll be fairly vague, but still it's impossible to avoid certain words. So it's, in my opinion, it's better for children to hear about this stuff from you all and in the church first, because if they don't, they're going to learn from it in the world. That was, in my case, growing up in the 70s. I learned about all this stuff in my friends' houses, like when I was five and six. And I was exposed to stuff in movies, Way before my parents wanted to talk, in fact, my parents never talked to me about it, to be honest. It's a little, sorry, mom. Uh, And they took us to movies they really shouldn't have. I mean, it was the early 1970s, the rating system was terrible, but nevertheless, I think it's all right for them to learn. But if you're not ready for that, I completely understand. I'm going to read the text. I will pray, and if you leave with your children, no questions asked. You can hang out in the back of the fellowship hall. Um, You can listen to the YouTube uh, version later and and see what they, so that's fine. No questions at all asked at all. I do hope you can stay for the the picture if possible. And if you stay and halfway through you start to regret it, I'm going to have a deacon come up here and announce that somebody has a car with their lights on, and everybody can pretend like it's theirs. Just empty out. Just, I mean, in fact, I, I have dreams like this. I look up from the pulpit and everybody's gone. So we'll make, we'll make room for that possibility. And then finally, to all of you, um, this is the sort of sermon that could go in a hundred different directions and has a hundred pitfalls. So I just ask for patience and grace. I'm not going to say everything right. The important thing is the Holy Spirit communicates to you his will for you, his love for you. So be prayerful about that. So as we go to it, I'm going to uh, read the text, going to pray. There's going to be a fairly long introduction to put it in context, and then as we have time, we'll try to make about five observations. Let's, let's read and pray. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning with verse 1. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. 
For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Let no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, as we come upon this very sensitive subject, we are aware that Paul, who loves this people, did not back down from calling them to live in pureness and holiness. Lord, we confess that we struggle. We struggle with this. Uh, as We struggle with all areas, and we pray for your grace. Help us to seek your forgiveness, your strength in Christ. Help us to grow in holiness. O oh Lord, help us to love one another with the bodies that you have given us. In whatever stage of life we are, in whatever state you have placed us, may we live for Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. When I was a freshman in college, it was uh, well before the internet. And so one tool that the college gave us to try to get to know our fellow classmates was something we literally called the Facebook. Now, if you've seen the movie, The Social Network, I think you know Harvard had one too. So we had this little white, thin book, glossy book, and it had a picture of, of all of us uh, in it. And then we could say two things. I think it may be at our hometown. And then two things, two hobbies, two likes. And uh, I was a bit of a nonconformist, and they, the categories were like tennis or reading. or It's like this is boring stuff. So I put down two of my great passions at the time. Jesus and America. Now, this was 1984, and I had just become a Christian and maybe hadn't thought things through in terms of my first, you know, how I would first be introduced to people, but it was still true. I do love both of those things still. But that's, I remember that about it. But the, the other thing I remember about it was it's far more sober. Uh, all the dorms in this, in this college had benches out front where the door mates would sit, including different fraternities. And whenever we won a basketball game, we'd burn one. I, I never understood that. If you lost a basketball game, you left them alone. If you won a big one, you, you destroy, destroyed something. Never made sense to me. But I remember walking by one of these benches right there in the main spot of campus, right in front of the main bus stop. And it was one of the, the, the most prestigious fraternities on campus, the one that was known to get the wealthy boys, the pretty boys. As I'm walking by the bench, two of the upperclassmen are sitting there, and they say, hey, freshman, can we have your book? And I was generous, and I was kind of embarrassed by Jesus in America, so I'm like, sure, you can take it. And I handed it over to them, and then in my presence, they opened it, and they began to go through it. And then I found out why this book was also called The Pig Book. And they began to circle pictures of the young women that they wanted to invite to parties, not knowing anything about them at all, but based purely on appearance. And then they began to put X's through the women they never would invite. Now, what do you think I did? I did not like it. I was disgusted by that. But I walked away as a coward. So much for Jesus in America. But that's the kind of culture that we live in. This was back in 1985. And you say, oh, I know, things started to get bad in the 1960s. Oh, no, let me tell you something. Things have always been bad since the fall of Adam and Eve. If you look at our letter, this is one of the earliest letters in the New Testament. It's written around A.D. 50. You might remember 
that Paul had planted this church up in the Greek city of Thessalonica. So it's right up there in the north coast between modern-day Turkey and the mainland of Greece now. It was a major cosmopolitan city, worldly in every way. It's still the second largest city in Greece, uh, filled with commerce and successful businesses. And it was out of that community that God called a people to trust in Christ, to live eternally. And that means to look different than the ways of the world, that they're going to be part of the new creation of love that Jesus came to establish. Look at verse, what is this, verse 4 and 5. He says to them, uh, this is the will, uh, your will of God, that each one of you know how to control his body and holiness and honor. Verse 5, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So different. Now, who are the Gentiles? It, 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 that word meant a couple of things back then. One, it meant everyone who wasn't Jewish. So you are a Gentile if you weren't part of Israel. But most of the believers in this church were Gentiles. They were Greeks. And so Paul is saying to them, no longer live like the people you have been called out from. Do you get that? It would be like me saying to you, oh, good, you've come to Christ. That's wonderful if you're American. Uh, sorry, that's I'm saying this in the wrong order. <laughs> Golly. All right, I told you it would be a mess. It, if, if you're American and you come to Christ, I would say no longer live like the Americans. No longer live like American values. Now, I just said I loved America, but there's so much about our culture, which is materialistic and selfish and self-glorifying and sexist and racist, that as Christians we want to live differently than the cultures we are called out from, whatever culture that may be. Every culture is infected by, by human sinfulness. And so Paul was, had, was chased out of Thessalonica, and he ends up down in Corinth, but he's worried about this, this young group of believers. So he sends up Timothy to get a report, and Timothy comes back with a report, and it's mostly encouraging, but he's finding out that there's this, this worldliness that's creeping into the church. Now, so Paul says, now then, I want to remind you to live like we instructed you to live, and here are some of the ways. And sexual purity is not the only thing he talks about, but it strikes me, doesn't it, in verse 3, that when he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, we get that. You want to know God's will for you this week? Like what classes, you, you, well, go to all your classes, but you know, who to hang out with, um, uh, you know, what, what, what is God's will? It's always your holiness, sanctification, that's, a, that's just a fancy word for being made to, to be more the person you are created to be, to become more holy, sanctified, set apart, separated. That's the will of God for you. But then the first thing he says, don't be sexually impure. And that hits me like a ton of bricks. Paul, why start there of all places? So I think it is interesting to consider. And I think it's because it's it's. It's, 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 it's one of the ways that God has made us to be in relationships. And it's one of the ways that we most easily rebel. One of the ways that we, we, it, it, we most easily reject God. We say, you can be, you can be Lord of my career. You, you can be Lord of the way I interact in the neighborhood. But my sexuality is my business. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, I want all of you. I love you that much. Now, a couple of things that we need to note here, they might be obvious to you, but I should state them. One is Paul does not say to abstain from sex. He himself was single, and he saw the benefits of that. There was a great blessing to being single, but he knows that it is a blessing from God in its proper context, which is a holy matrimony between a man and a woman. And Jesus confirms that that was God's plan for creation. Now, it gets disordered right away, and we see all sorts of defects in the Old Testament. But when Christ comes back in Mark 10 and Matthew 19, he says, clearly, this is God's will. This is how you grow in holiness, because it is such an intimate part of our lives. It is meant for only one other person at a time, just to be really clear about that. And so it is a difficult area. That's the first thing, though. It is holy and good in its proper context. But a second thing is that this word here, porneia, is wide-ranging. It includes all forms of sexual immorality, not just adultery. 
He wants the Thessalonians to abstain from adultery, from premarital intimacy, from uh, harassment and, and, and sexual violence, from homosexuality, from pornography, which did exist uh, in a limited form in that day. And this is exactly, of course, the, what Jesus taught. But then Jesus makes it clear where all of this comes from. He says, suppose you look at a woman and you do not commit adultery with her, but you commit adultery with her in your heart. It's like you have already in terms of your own holiness, in terms of your need for forgiveness and grace. You are coveting someone that is not yours. You are trying to control something that you shouldn't. And you need grace and forgiveness and growth, not just in the way you physically operate, but in your own mind and heart. It always starts there. But then Paul, back to our text, as he goes on in verse 4, it's not just about avoiding uh, 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 all sorts of different sins, and it's important here that we don't just single out one and pick on one as, 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 as kind of the culture wars want us to do. Is it's not just about avoiding all forms of sexual impurity, look at verse 4, but that we know how to control our own bodies in, hol in holiness and honor. Now, I need to note as we go through this text, that, that first phrase in verse 4 is, is notoriously difficult to translate. And you can go into the commentators and read all sorts of disagreements about what the Greek means there. So some think Paul is saying, actually, this is the way you live holiness, to obtain for yourself a wife. They, just, they translate the words differently. And, and, and then this is where you grow in holiness, is with one wife in marriage. Uh, and others say, no, it's really about controlling your own members. Either way, the point is, the physical bodies God has given us were created to serve others. Everything you do, whether married or not married, uh, uh, there's, th 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 you are given literal body parts that are given to you in order to love and serve others. And that's what, frankly, most of the New Testament talks about. There's way more in the New Testament about the use of our tongue and speech than there is about this. But it makes sense, doesn't it? We want to love others in terms of, 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 of abstaining from violence and showing proper affection if invited to and welcome and encouraging and useful. You see what I'm saying? Of showing up to meetings. You have to physically show up or at least turning on the Zoom. Of using your speech rightly. And that would then include our most intimate parts that can be used in the most wonderful, meaningful, life-giving ways, but they also can lead to a lot of selfishness and harm, not only to yourself, but to others. And he wants, Paul wants us to abstain from that, to use our bodies in, in love and holiness. As he goes on, he'll later talk about work and about Preparing for death. John Stott is a great commentator who I appreciate. And John Stott, if you know who he was, an Anglican minister, was single his entire life. But the point is, is that Paul wants all of our lives to be used in service and love for others. It doesn't matter what stage of life you're in or what your marital status ever is. It's the same principle that we live in holiness and honor and in service to others. And listen, we have all fallen here. I've had people come and confess to me various problems over the years and things that nobody else would have known. And, and godly people, godly men, um, if, if, if you're struggling with this, it's, better, it's usually better to find someone of your own uh, gender to confess to and to get help and accountability from. And, and, and one man in particular is just so godly and and so winsome and, and, and it just was committed to Christ in every way. And he came and, com and, and confessed to me just a particular struggle he was having in his mind. And he just said, why? Why am I having this struggle? And I said to him, because you're a sinner like the rest of us. Welcome to the club. We all need grace and forgiveness in this area. And that's important because as you run into people that struggle in very other kinds of sexual uh, errors that you don't fall into, you need to treat them with the grace and the love that God has given to you. Even while calling them to holiness if they are followers of Christ. So all of this is to say by introduction that we have to understand this call to holiness 
in light of what Paul says in the very first verse, finally then, brothers, right? So he's taken three chapters to explain to them how much God loves them in Christ, how they are forgiven, how Jesus came and took a body and, and lived in perfect holiness, never sinning, and then offered himself up as a sacrifice so that all our sins would be washed away. And the only thing that hurts us now is hiding our sin. That's, that's what we confessed earlier, trying to pretend we don't struggle, so we hold on to it, and then we ache, our, our souls ache, even if nobody else knows about it. But then we come to the Lord, and how blessed are we when our sins are forgiven. Then we can show, even though we've committed great sins, whatever our past is, we walk in grace, we walk in God's love, and we're still here. And so we are called to, to then use the rest of our lives to serve him so we can shout with joy. That's the gospel. That's where Paul starts. And then he says, this is what that looks like. Do you understand that? So parents, just an application right here. Look, look at verse chapter 4, verse 1. He says, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord. Notice the, 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 the verbs there. He begins by saying, I ask you, I, I'm, I'm, I want you to live in holiness. You begin that, you begin with grace with your children, and then you say, now please, I live this way, I'm asking you, and then you urge them. Morality is not relative. You do have to urge your children, we have to urge one another, but we begin by trusting the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. We want changed hearts, not just changed outward behaviors. And so that is Paul's approach here. He, he wants to build them up. You can look to chapter 3. He's giving thanksgiving to them. He's wanting them to grow in holiness, and he's praying for them. And then he says, this is what that looks like. I'm asking you to grow in love more and more. So let's look then, I just as we have time, uh, just five, I think, brief observations about the text itself. I've tried to be careful. I'll try to be even more careful. And the first is, that what Paul is instructing here is, is not a matter of human opinion. Look at how he sums it all up in verse 8. Whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives the Holy Spirit to you. This, this, is, this is not just moral relativism, and every church can pick their own way. We want to live the way God has told us to live in his word, because he loves us, and he knows best. And that's why back in verse 2, he he urges them, he says, you know the instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Or first, in verse 1, he urges you in the Lord Jesus. These are the instructions through the Lord Jesus. Paul's not making this up. He met the risen Christ. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. He's the true king of the world. And so Paul is simply representing the teachings of Jesus. And then notice this little phrase here, and I think this is helpful for our time, where he says, uh, to, where is this? Live as you are already doing, as I've, we have already taught you. There's nothing new here. This is, this is Christian Ethics 101. You see, this is very important in our age because we are under pressures from all sides in our culture. From the left, we are told we have to tolerate other people's lifestyles and particularly the gay agenda these days, right? It's, just, it's out there because that's the, that's the latest cultural thing. And that we have to embrace it as normal. And we're trying to say, okay, you all live like you need to live or want to live. We're going to do what we need to do over here in the church. You cannot require us to embrace as true that which we do not believe is true. This, and this, is, this, this has been standard Christian teaching for 2,000 years. There's nothing, we're, we're not the ones parting ways. So that's on the one side. But then on the right we, 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 we are exposed to the kind of uh, 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 abuse culture of the rich and the powerful. And we're told that marital purity is nitpicky. And of course, we should not expect political leaders to hold to it, not if they're on our side. And so we downplay sexual purity for them. The point is we don't expect everyone to agree with us, but we're simply trying to follow the teachings of our Savior who loves them as much as he loves us. And so verse 2 is important in the realm of, in our day, of, of sexual ethics, because there are those in the church who try to drive a wedge between Paul and Jesus, especially on the issue of homosexuality. They say Jesus never addresses the issue, but emphasizes love. Well, look, uh, Paul emphasizes love. That's, he wrote 1 Corinthians 13, after all. 
they say Paul is either a bigot, and we can ignore his teachings in this area, or he's simply talking about temple prostitution, a particular uh, problem back then, and 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 then what. The Thessalonican culture, just like all of Greek and Roman culture, was hypersexualized, worse than our own in so many ways. And so they're saying Paul is dealing with that. But as I've already said, Jesus does address the issue. He affirms God's standard of marriage in Mark 10 and Matthew 19 as simply reaffirming Genesis 2, that God made a man and a woman. Now, there is confusion out there. Uh, there there's these, these uh, rare medical exceptions but the point is that there is no wedge, there's no distance between Jesus and Paul on this issue. There's a second important point, though, even as we affirm that, that notice who these instructions are given to. And we might miss this. Paul is writing to the Thessalonican believers, okay? That's the whole presupposition. He's written to those who've already heard the gospel, who've already accepted Christ as their Savior, who are called out into this holy community. He is not writing this to the Gentile unbelievers, not here. That's what verse 5 is all about. I'm calling you out. We're, the, the Holy Spirit's calling you out from those folks. We do not expect all of society to agree with us on this. This is so important because we are dragged into the culture wars uh, where, where we are expecting to, to live in a Christian society that's never been the case. And I was a history major, and I can promise you that when Christians, uh, by name, were in charge and were the wealthy and powerful, they absolutely allowed sexual impurity among the rich and the powerful. Just look at the kings of England, just for instance. I mean, it's, as a, uh, look at our own list of presidents, if you want to just get really personal. The point is, as believers in Christ, we are part of new creation. We are a, a colony of heaven. We are people that live in holiness and purity and love. And Paul is basically saying in verse 5 that they are living after lust. They're living for themselves. They do not know God. So, of course, they're living for themselves. And that takes all sorts of forms and shapes, greed, power, lying, manipulation, self-promotion, but also the control of others in sexual relations for selfish ends. Paul says, no longer be part of that. So let me be very specific. If you have a gay neighbor or see a business flying a rainbow flag, that's not your worry. Assuming we know what rainbow flags mean these days. And frankly, if it's a good business and they put out a good product, I'd feel free to use them. That's up to you, but I don't see any reason why not. We live in the world. Paul makes this really clear in 1 Corinthians 5, and I, I really think this is helpful for us as we live ourselves in holiness, but are trying to love our neighbors that are in all sorts of disbelief. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the, or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. See, it puts them all together. Since then, you'd have to go out of the world. You'd have to join a monastery where, by the way, that stuff still exists. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or an idolater, revival or drunkard or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Our job is to help one another to grow in holiness. And those that are outside, our first job is to tell them about the love of Christ and let him change them from within. Do you see that? I think it gives us a great posture towards the world as we ourselves hold to what we believe while yet still loving them, knowing that they don't agree with us on these things. Third, Notice the motivation that Paul gives for pursuing godliness, and this is critical. He says in verse, where is this, verse 1 still, we ought to walk in order to please God. This word walk is, is so important to Paul. It's, it's about everyday living. It's not, the Christian life's not just huge events or crises or sitting up in a tower it's about every day, going to work, what television shows you watch, 
uh, uh, what you decide to read, how you treat other people, all of it is it, what your, your orientation is to please God. It's not just living up to expectations and following rules and making sure you're wearing the right clothes and all that. You're, you are following God. You belong to Christ. That, and so that gives you motivation to do what is right in secret as well as what is in public. Because if we just worry about following the, the exterior rules, what's going to happen? We're going to find loopholes and ways around it. That even societies which highly honor marriage find all sorts of ways for men to get away with sexual impurity. There's all sorts of, of, of red light districts in countries where there's, there's blasphemy laws and, and adultery laws, and yet they have these red light districts. They find loopholes. Or as an army colleague used to say to me, he says, it's okay to look, just don't touch. Well, that keeps it legal, but it doesn't keep it holy. Paul says, we should want to please God, knowing that we're still going to fail every day, but knowing that he loves us anyway. But we want to do what's right by him. And that's why it is always encouraging to me when, when people come to f confess their struggles in this area. Nobody would have known if some of these, these sins that people commit, especially with the easy access to pornography these days, but they want to be right before God. Even if they keep slipping up, that is their motivation. And there's ways to find accountability. Um, the, we don't advertise this widely, but the church has a Covenant's Eyes account where you can join and, and make sure that whatever you go to on the Internet is someone you know, keeping an eye on it and just trying to help you. And you find someone that's not going to slam you, but say, hey, look like you slipped up there on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. What's going on? And, and you could say, oh, no, that was actually I was just shopping or whatever. You know, but the point is, is you, that you care. You care enough to take it seriously that every part of your life belongs to Jesus. One of the most difficult things in my life was a good friend and colleague, a minister, pastored a big church, was pursuing his PhD. And he and I were pretty close. In fact, the first time I met Taylor Rolo was on a comment section on his blog, and I thought Taylor made an intelligent comment. I'm like, hey, you should apply here. Just see, maybe see if it works out. And here he is 11 years later. That was on my friend's website. My friend was living a secret life. He got addicted to pornography, and then he had affairs. Eventually, he ended up running a working with prostitutes, and eventually, he ended up taking his life. This was a huge deal for me. And yet, we just ignore it as a denomination and as a church. We barely talk about it. And so I pled with Presbytery in private. I said, if we, you are struggling, please get help. If my friend had come to us early on when he started to slip and asked for help, we would not have run him out. We would not have slammed him with the law. We would have provided him help. And he would have grown in holiness with God's help, and he would still be alive today, ministering even more grace than when he started. But instead, he was scared. He was scared of what we would do to him. And he was selfish, and he hid it. And his life ended up in a trip wreck. These things happen. And I could mention more famous names in the Christian community. Jim Baker, Ted Haggart, Bill Hybels, Ravi Zacharias, Jerry Falwell Jr., all men with huge ministries. And yet, down deep, not living to please God. They live just like the world. And the world sees that, and they see that we are hypocrites. So they think that we're really just about power and worldliness, and we're just using the church to live for ourselves. May it not be so among us. Let's be weak. Let's be uninfluential. Let's not have huge ministries. And let's be holy. There's a fourth, and I need to move on. And this follows right up. This is so wonderful. Look at the end of verse 1. Just as you are doing and that you do so more and more, we get better. This is why we encourage one another 
The Holy Spirit is on our side. Jesus is on our side. We are on one another's side, and we do grow in this. We get more holy. Again, one of my privileges is to hear people's confessions and sins, and then also to see God work holiness in their lives and see them to grow. And when they slip up, that it doesn't ruin their lives, when they come and confess and they grow. One of the, I can tell this, one of the greatest joys here was, was with a couple that kind of jumped the gun on the, the wedding thing, and they ended up getting pregnant before the ceremony. And what did they do? They came and told us. And as a church, we accepted them. We had a meeting. We announced it. And that was the last they ever heard of it. And then they moved on to another city. And nobody has to know unless they are super good at math and inquisitive. And and even if they find out, so what? That's what grace is for. So we get better. We grow. I saw it in them. I've seen it in my life. And I see it in you all. Finally, as I have said throughout the sermon, look at the, the Paul makes it clear. What are we to live for? It's not just abstaining. It's not just avoiding things. Look at verse uh, 7. We're called to holiness. And then verse 6, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger. So if we begin by trying to make sure that we're pleasing God and growing in this and giving one another grace, where does it end? If it's about loving God, it's making sure we don't hurt others. It's making sure that all of our body parts are used to serve others in whatever status we are in. So you're, you're not just thinking, what do I need? What do I want? What will fulfill me? What will give me a thrill? You're thinking, how can I love that other person? And when you're married, that's exactly what marriage is for. And when it comes to dealing with this world and looking at the way particularly powerful men, usually men, treat others and objectify them and abuse them, we stand up to it. And we say, we are not here to hurt others. And I will have no part of that. And so Paul ends with this positive principle. That Jesus has called us to holiness. He's not just saved us from hell and condemnation. He's called us to this holy community. And it's a holy community that uses all of its gifts by God's help and service to others. That we would not hurt others. That our lives would be about others. And Paul wrote this as a single. That's the point. Our culture says the sex is the, is the main thing to live for. It's all, it's the closest they can come to an experience with God in their mind. That's what the Greeks did with their temple prostitution. And Paul says, no, that's not the main point. What gives life meaning is loving and serving others. That's what will last. And that's what's going to give you fulfillment. Let's pray. Our God and Father, this is a, a difficult topic to delve into because it, it touches all of us. Lord, we, we all need forgiveness. And we all need help. Thank you that I get to be part of a gracious church where I can talk about these things and, and be weak and not have to have it all together. Thank you, Lord, that we 